In chapters one and two, we examined what taxation is and how the United States federal government established its taxation policy. In this chapter, we'll look at the tax compliance process, the filing requirements, how the IRS enforces filing requirements, the consequences of non-compliance, and how a taxpayer can appeal IRS decisions. For most individuals, income is earned from January 1st of the calendar year through December 31st of the calendar year. Individuals who work for themselves are required to estimate and pay taxes periodically throughout the year. Individuals who are employed by another person have their income tax withheld from each paycheck and the employer files a quarterly income statement on their behalf. Individual persons must generally file their income tax return by April 15th. For those who fail to file an income tax return and fail to file an extension, they must pay penalties equal to 5% of the balance of tax due with the return, as well as interest on the amount of income tax payable after the income tax deadline. The 5% balance continues for the first five months after the missed deadline. Thereafter, the penalty rate falls to one half percent of the balance due for up to another 45 additional months. Once an income tax return is filed, the IRS validates it based on the complementary documents filed by the employer on behalf of the individual. If the IRS detects errors, they'll refer the tax return back to the taxpayer. If there are no errors immediately detected, they'll process the payment and or the refund. Let's take a look at late filing penalties. What would have happened if Professor T defended her dissertation on April 15th and forgot to file for an IRS extension? She actually filed her return on May 14th, 2018. What would be her late filing penalty if her Form 1040 showed a $690 refund? The answer is zero because Professor T owes, is owed money by the government. When you owe money to the government and miss the filing deadline, they don't impose penalties on you. However, this is effectively an interest-free loan to the government because the $690 refund is money the government over withheld from Professor T's paycheck. Now what would happen if her income tax statement showed a tax liability of 219? She filed her income tax return one month late, meaning that she now owes $11 in addition to any interest that may have accrued on the tax liability. Once the IRS has accepted your return, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're free from audit or free from error. Generally, the IRS has three years in which to audit your return and assess additional tax. Three years from April 15th of the year filed or the actual date of filing, whichever happens to be later. If the IRS detects an egregious taxpayer error, they have six years from April 15th of the year in which the income tax return was filed, or six years from the actual date of filing, whichever is later. And we'll talk in a minute about what comprises an egregious taxpayer error. If the IRS detects a fraudulent return, there is no statute of limitations. If you attempt to defraud the US government, with your tax return, they can come after you at any time. So let's look at the application of the statute of limitations. 
Nicolas Cage, the somewhat famous actor, has been in trouble with the law a couple times for attempting to swindle the IRS. In 2007, he deducted $600,000 of unallowable office expenses from his tax return. If he filed on April 15, 2007, and his 2007 revenue was $54 million, what is the last date on which the IRS could assess additional tax? The distinction here has to do with how much money he earned. Ordinarily, the IRS has three years in which to audit the return and assess penalty, unless the misstatement was a case of egregious error. What comprises an egregious error? To be an egregious error, the error amount must be greater than or equal to 25% of the individual's adjusted gross income. Nick Cage's $600,000 deduction is much, much less than 25% of $54 million. So the IRS has three years in which to come after Nick Cage and assess additional taxes. However, the IRS can assess interest and penalties on that underpayment. And we'll get back to that. Now, let's look at another one of Nicolas Cage's tax foibles. In 2009, he failed to report the income equaling $24 million that he earned on two of his movies. If his reported revenue was $29 million, what is the last date on which the IRS can assess additional tax liability? Well, $24 million out of $29 million is almost 100%. This meets the egregious error requirement of the IRS, which means they have at least six years to come after Nick Cage. However, if the IRS were to determine that Nicholas Cage willfully and intentionally attempted to defraud the government, there's no limit to the statute. They can come after him at any time if they determine that the transaction was actually an attempt at fraud. IRS detects irregular activity, it typically engages in an audit. There are three types of IRS audits. The first is a correspondence examination. This is an IRS audit that is handled entirely by telephone or mail. The IRS will not come to your place of work and you will not be required to go to the IRS. An office examination is an IRS audit conducted by a tax auditor at an IRS district office. And a field examination is an IRS audit conducted by a tax auditor at the taxpayer's place of business. The difference between an office examination and a field examination, besides the location, is the scope. A field examination is generally broader in scope than an office examination. If, through the course of an IRS audit, the IRS detects error or fraud, the IRS can impose additional penalties on the taxpayer. And these penalties range in severity based on the severity of the offense. The lowest severity, a frivolous tax return, is a blatantly incorrect or incomplete tax return based on a legal argument without merit. The textbook gives an example of a taxpayer who filed his return by mail and cited a spurious argument in defense of why he should not pay taxes. Not only did the IRS impose taxes on the gentleman, they also imposed a $5,000 penalty on him for wasting their time and wasting government resources. Negligence is a failure to make a reasonable attempt at preparing a correct return 
or an intentional disregard for federal tax laws and regulation. The penalty for negligence is 20% of the tax liability that would additionally be due. The IRS is responsible for determining whether an error on a tax return is due to negligence or is truly due to an error. A strong case for negligence is whether the taxpayer should have known better. A taxpayer who has a CPA certification or earns their MBA should know the tax law, for example, the presence of supporting documentation to justify tax decisions can be used to justify error versus negligence, as well as cooperation during the audit. A civil fraud is the intention to cheat the government by deliberately understating liability. Civil fraud is penalizable by 75% of the underpayment attributable to the fraud. Fraud includes the systematic omission of substantial amounts of income from the return or by the deduction of non-existent expenses slash losses. This may be indicated by a taxpayer keeping two sets of books, one for tax purposes and one for true record keeping. In order to prove civil fraud, the IRS must present an overwhelming proof of fraud occurrence. Finally, criminal fraud. This is a willful and deliberate attempt to evade or defeat any tax. Criminal fraud, criminal fraud is a felony offense and is punishable by severe fines up to and including federal imprisonment. Such cases go to the federal courts wherein the IRS must establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It's important to note that in cases of criminal fraud, the IRS will turn to a criminal investigator. So let's apply our understanding of the tax code by looking at the negligence and the fraud penalties that would be imposed on Mr. Cage for his omission. If the IRS determined that Nick Cage's liability would have been $6.4 million higher had he included the income, what would be the penalty if the IRS found the emission to simply be one of negligence? The negligence penalty from the IRS is 20% of the income omission, which in this case would be 1.28 million. the IRS found the omission to be negligent. However, if the IRS found the omission to be fraudulent in that he had deliberately undersold the government, which is probably likely given the fact that he had an accountant telling him what to do, the penalty is 75%. which is, and the penalty had the IRS found him to be fraudulent and not criminally fraudulent would be $4.8 million. And speaking of being held to a higher standard, the IRS holds tax preparers to a higher standard than regular individual filers who prepare their own tax returns. This includes attorneys, CPAs, or enrolled agents with the IRS. As part of this higher standard, tax preparers are required to sign the return and include their tax identification number on the prepared return. Tax preparers also have additional filing requirements. They're required to provide clients with copies of their prepared return as well as retain copies of client returns for an extended period of time. Tax preparers who mess up the returns of their clients can be held responsible for preparer negligence. A violation of procedural rules 
carry the monetary penalty with a maximum penalty of 26,000 per year. A tax preparer who assumes an unreasonable legal assumption that results in an understatement of tax liability is subject to the greater of $1,000 or 50% of the filing fee charged to the client. A willful understatement of tax liability or an intentional disregard of the tax law carries a penalty of $5,000 or 75% of the fee charged to the client. This holds preparers to a higher accountability and encourages them to do the right thing and avoid losing their livelihood. So what happens if, after an audit, the taxpayer still disagrees with the IRS's judgment? The taxpayer has a number of appeals, the first of which is the IRS Appeals Office. When a taxpayer appeals to the IRS, this triggers a conference between the taxpayer and the IRS office. The objective of this appeal is to resolve the tax controversy fairly and impartially. If the taxpayer still disagrees with the finding, he can pay the tax and sue the government for reimbursement of the claim. The taxpayer has three different options for disputing a tax claim by the IRS. The first is tax court. While this is a smaller organization, they have specific tax expertise. So on the one hand, you'll have an easier time getting in and out of the tax court. But on the other, you might not find a sympathetic audience since they know the tax law. Your second is the US District Court. And the third is the US Court of Federal Claims which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. The losing party can appeal the lower court's verdict to one of the 13 appellate courts in the nation. Once the appellate court hears the case, it can be appealed to the Supreme Court, although this is rare for the Supreme Court to hear a tax case. Any of the tax decisions that become of a lower court or an appellate court become precedent for future tax conditions that result from similar backgrounds. An alternative to litigation is a small tax case division of the tax court. If the tax liability being disputed is relatively small, less than $50,000, the taxpayer can request an informal hearing with an officer of the court. The taxpayer pays a $60 administrative fee, which is lower than the legal fees would likely be in the case of a tax court, but the ruling cannot be appealed. Once it's determined, it's final. In any case, the IRS is liable for the court costs if the IRS loses. And there's a few exceptions that are discussed in the book. Finally, once it's determined that a taxpayer has underpaid or has failed to pay the tax, the IRS has any of a number of collection procedures. The taxpayer can agree to an installment arrangement wherein the taxpayer makes monthly payments to the IRS over a period of time not to exceed 36 months. The IRS has to grant such an appeal as long as the tax liability is below a certain amount, and the request is reasonable. If the IRS has doubt of the taxpayer's financial solvency, as well as their ability to pay, the IRS may accept a compromise, wherein the taxpayer and the IRS negotiate a settlement in which the taxpayer pays less than the entire deficiency. Although this class specifically focuses on individual tax liability, it's important to note that as long as a taxpayer did not receive assets from a corporation at its dissolution, the taxpayer cannot be held liable for corporate tax liability that goes unpaid.
In this unit, we learned about the IRS enforcement process and the taxpayer resolution process if they dispute what the IRS determines. In the next unit and module, we'll begin at the individual tax formula, as well as the income requirements and deduction requirements for income taxation.